We were just at the Open Source Summit in Seattle, and I had several great conversations with open source community leaders about maintainer burnout and why it's a real problem in the open source community and for open source projects. We talked about its implications on security and also what we can do about it as a community. So, yeah, first of all, maintainer burnout is real. Uh, you know, when you look at the world of open source, I always think of open source represents this incredible treasure for humanity. And behind open source software is, is real people. And it's easy to forget that a lot of the people that are working on open source are not doing it for money, they're doing it for love. And the reality is uh, that you know, when you're working on a project for a long time, uh, it can become tiresome, it can become challenging. And a lot of the people that you tend to interact with forget that you're doing it for love, not for money, in, in the case of many of these maintainers. And so, from my perspective, I, I look at the fact that you know, open source is such a critical capability, the fact that open source is constantly being repackaged into a lot of different form factors and reused in a lot of different ways, uh, and the fact that a lot of the folks that are behind the scenes maintaining um, these critical repackaged open source technologies um, are under you know, constant pressure, it, it represents the substantial and existential threat to the way that we consume technology today. And so something has to change. And I think you know, the, there's a couple of things that, 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 that should happen over the next little bit. First of all, we need to develop a way to recognize and respect and ultimately support individuals that are under strain. We need to find that lone de developer in Nebraska and bring them the support that they need. And that doesn't mean just paying them money. It means bringing them the things that they're really asking for, better tooling, um, additional individuals that might participate and carry some of the load for them. Because at the end of the day, that's what people really want. So we need systems in place that we can start to identify and support those people. We need to hold vendors accountable to giving back to these communities. So you know, one of the things that I, I really hope that you know, people start to think about on the back of things like the XC vulnerability and on the back of some of the, the pressure that we're seeing in open source communities is, is the vendor that you're looking to buy the solution from contributing to open source communities or are they strip mining open source communities? And I hope that vendors that contribute and vendors that are supportive ultimately get customers voting with their wallets to come and support them uh, over time. And then I think finally, um, you know, we, we also have a lot of hope. You know, generative AI is changing the ecosystem. Generative AI represents an opportunity to bring new capabilities, new tools, and take some of the drudge work out and hopefully enable maintainers to be more uh, sort of sustainable and focus on things that, that excite them. So, you know, between these things, better tooling, better recognition, and uh, encouraging vendors to, you know, act with decency and, and, and support communities is, is going to be really important for the future. Yeah, about three or four years into the Helm project, uh, we hit sort of this period of, of like collective burnout. Several of us really burned out around the same time. And, and we experienced it because in part, you know, we had worked on a lot of the, of, of the cool features we wanted to do when we were starting to hit that part of the roadmap that was just the really difficult problems, a uh, lot of maintenance burden, the issue queue was, what was starting to feel unmanageable. Uh, and in, in part, it was because we everything was in production, right? When you're in that creative space at the beginning, it's very energizing. But at some point, you're in production at other people's companies, and you are sort of, in a secondhand sort of way, feeling responsible for what happens when things go wrong there. And when you get issues coming into the issue queue in those scenarios, people are often starting from a position of anger or frustration or, 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 or despair, right? And, and you feel those emotions when you're, when you're triaging the issue queue. And I think at one point, a bunch of us just started to feel the drag effect of that. Uh, and and it, it had gotten to the point where for a little while, it wasn't so much that we weren't motivated to work on new features, it was really like, how do we just keep the lights on right now and, and, and feel okay? Please. Getting over emotions like that can be a, can be a hard thing to do. Uh, one thing we discovered that helped us a lot was we just kind of got it out in the open. A lot of us talked about it. And then we start, started working on, okay, how can we rotate a couple of people on and a couple of people off at a time? We had the advantage that at that point, about half of the core maintainers of Helm were working at Microsoft. And so we had a little bit of control over our daily schedules and could help shift things around there. Uh, that definitely helped. The, the group support helped a lot, right? Just talking about it out loud, uh, setting up a way for somebody to discuss openly. You know, my mental health level right now is a little low. I need a couple of days, but I can pick things up again. Uh, 
we also we worked on growing the contributor base and we all talk about oh that's a great way to to combat burnout it was actually sort of exacerbated it a little bit at the beginning because trying to find people willing to step in and get them trained was actually hard and was an emotional investment but longer term that paid off really well and a lot of the people that came in uh were not coming in with sort of like the the i guess you'd call it like the the founder's perspective or the original creator's perspective where there was a lot of maybe you know uh, personal identity sort of wrapped up in the project. For them, they were coming in it as operators first, saying, we've been using Helm for a long time. We've got some ideas on how to make it more usable. But more than that, we just care about sort of helping people get the job done. So getting that fresh round of people in there uh, with a different perspective really helped the rest of us even out. Uh, and then the other thing we did that actually, it was a small thing, but it made a huge difference. We sat down at one point and we said, uh, we're going to write up a like a how to handle an issue thing where we're going to say when a new PR comes in or a new issue comes in, here's a pattern we're all going to follow. You know, if they come from it frustrated, start out by saying, I'm sorry, you're having a hard time with this. Help us understand what this is. You know, here's how to uh, here's how to here's some documentation you can look at that might help you. But the pattern was really designed around empathy. And by doing that, by saying, here's how you start with addressing the user's emotional state, then you move on from this into, you know, starting to help them figure out how to provide you the information you need to troubleshoot. We did the same thing in PRs. The first line of the PR review would always be, thank you so much for contributing this, right? And start by acknowledging and being gracious about it. And then you could kind of go into the PR and say, you know, we can't accept it while this part is looking this way. But what it did for the people on the other side is it de-escalated their emotions, which then in turn meant we had to, we had less to absorb, right? But what it did for our part was it gave us a template that allowed us to sort of emotionally detach a little bit and say, okay, well, the process is acknowledge the user's emotions, you know, thank them for their work, you know, start to help them on the path to, to, to discovering the, the bug or solving the problem and move on from there. So it was a way of sort of emotionally de-escalating on both sides of that. And that helped us a lot. Uh, but, you know, ultimately when it comes to burnout, I think everybody kind of has to acknowledge if you've gotten all the way to the burnout stage, stepping away for a little while is the main thing you often have to do to just decompress. So we learned, you know, to kind of be able to tell a little bit before burnout. And once you've got those sort of good mental health practices where people are talking about how they feel about it, then you can start saying, ooh, you're getting a little close to the burnout there. Uh, you know, instead of burning you out and then you having to take a long, uh, long, you know, extended stay of absence from a project, you know, you want a couple weeks to just sort of go on, you know, PR triaging duty or step down or do something else for a little while. And that kind of thing helped quite a bit. Ooh, such a challenging topic. And I feel like there's a lot of conversation going on around maintainer burnout, at least in the spaces that I'm in all the time, because it's one of the most challenging issues facing open source today. We had some uh, issues recently with open source projects where it's like, if your maintainers are burned out, they can't be protecting the, the code base like they, they are going to need to be. Um, so it's one of the major risk factors, honestly, with using open source is that the maintainers will be burned out and not be able to accept new feature requests that you need or um, maybe they're just super tired one day and they accept something that maybe wasn't as good as they thought that it was when they read through it. So. It's a real security issue in, in open source. And ways that we can address it, there's so much discussion always happening. Um, I like to aim toward things. Um, I think the best solutions are the ones where we work together. Because putting all of the load on one person is a lot of what leads to that burnout. And I've had a lot of really good experiences in open source recently. Um, where we build a team around uh, a project. And when someone tries to take on too much, because open source maintainers like to do that, because we're all type A, <laughs> we all want to, to take on as much work as we can. Um, but when you have other folks working together with you on the project, we can kind of catch that in each other and kind of even out the load kind of naturally. So I think uh, an important tactic that we can employ ourselves is to build teams and put processes in place where we're working together and we have those kind of um, checks and balances 
where we can keep each other from taking on too much. Um, beyond that, of course, there's a lot of conversations going on about uh, how we pay open source contributors, how we convince um, companies to to pay more open source contributors, and that's an important part of it too. But I love focusing on the things that we can do ourselves. I know a lot of people are focusing right now on the security aspect of maintainer burnout, but it's also important to look at, I think, two, two particular dimensions. So the first one is actually for the health of the developers themselves. So a lot of people are saying, well, what can we do from security to make sure that bad things don't happen? But we need to make sure that uh, the people who are doing the work have sustainable lifestyles, that they are able to be happy with what they're working on. And if they're not, then how can we set up the environment so that they can they can get help if they, if they need it? Uh, I think when people talk about uh, security, the one of the questions that they really should be asking is is about risk because security is is primarily about how do you identify what those risks are and then we go off and, and mitigate them. And I think it would be wise to expand the question to not just how do we prevent another XC style attack, but instead to ask a more fundamental question as to what are the risks for all of the key uh, stakeholders including the including the open source developers who, who are present. Um, things that we can do about it, uh, I think it depends on where you are. Like uh, if you're working with a larger company, it could be it could be as simple as uh, perhaps setting part of part of a, like funding the OSPO offices to go and perhaps fund some of these particular groups. Or, or some of these individuals, uh, offering them additional help to code review on particular topics. Uh, we could set up like maybe task groups or similar to say, hey, I really need a review on this particular thing. I don't have, I don't know very many people who are experts or don't have access to people who, uh, I don't want to burn them out. So perhaps there's something we can do from a community perspective where we could have people who uh, are hired primarily and also taking into consideration their sustainability. Mm -hmm. uh, but perhaps we can have something where for things that uh, that are, especially if they're critical, that uh, they're able to deliver that help when, when it's needed. Um, for, uh, for open source developers, I also think it's important for us to also look after each other as well. Like if I see a colleague of mine is uh, starting to, to burn out or uh, a friend of mine in the open source community, uh, even just going and, and talking to them, say, hey, are, are things okay, or how are you feeling? Like, even if there's nothing that you could act, act actionally do, even just that conversation can get that person to start thinking about their health and, they, and maybe uh, start to, to enable change in those areas. My name is Adolfo Garcia, or Warco usually. Um, I am one of the Kubernetes SIG release uh, tech leads. I also maintain uh, Protobom and OpenVex in the OpenSF and other SOM tools. Yeah, it's a really tough question. Um, so open source is mainly run by volunteers. And it's really easy to have expectations on the amount of work you can take on. And then sometimes reality in life hits. Yeah. And then you take on work that can be really you know, critical for security that has security implications. And then something may change in your life and then you find yourself having less time to do that work. And then that leads to burnout really, really quickly because you have the pressure from, for example, work. And then you have your users that are demanding features. You have all of those, for example, when a CV hits your project, mm -hmm. you need to respond quickly because uh, yeah. you know you have potentially thousands of users that could be affected, and you need to get uh, get uh, like solve those problems. And then life can be, you know, squishing you between those, and then that leads to stressful situations for maintainers. Um, and sometimes you'll see that when it when it's a, a something like a CVE, mm -hmm. uh, you, re, you sh usually react quickly because it's patching and things like that. But building more security into your project takes extra work. 
It's work that it's not necessarily uh, related to features. It's not necessarily related to your usual bug fixes. It's additional work that you have to take on. So with maintainers being overworked, under pressure, it's hard to, uh, you know, to have a, an environment where those things can thrive easily. This is a critically important conversation, so join us and help us move it forward together. Follow us on social media, uh, join in the conversation, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>